What drove these kids to crime? Crime so deadly that the only option was capital punishment, the ultimate penalty, death. Child executions are a rarity, but what led these young ones to commit what authorities deemed the craziest of crimes? Why were they tried as adults? And why did they get such severe punishment? Sean Sellers. Starting off with Sean Richard Sellers, whose case global garnered attention due to his age, conversion to Christianity while in prison, and detailed assertion that demonic possession led him to commit his offenses. We didn't take any money. We didn't take any merchandise. We only took the, the life of an innocent man for Satan. Sean Sellers grew up in Oklahoma City and committed three murders before he even turned 17. His trial and confessions, however, were what shook the world. Sellers maintained that his Satanism and his allegiance to demons were to blame. But who was he and what kind of childhood did he have? Was he born evil or did he snap at some point in his life? Sean was born on the 18th of May, 1969. His mother, Vonda, had him when she was 16, a year after she got married, and pretty much prioritized him all her life. Sean's dad took off before Sean could count the stars and reportedly had a terrible drinking problem due to his inability to make a living out of his singing talent. This caused Vonda to work tirelessly to fend for herself and her little boy. Unfortunately for Sean, he had to be independent from a very young age. Even though he played football as a junior in high school and was a bright boy, it was also difficult for him to make and keep friends because they moved around so much. I like being alone. I liked that solitude. I never really had a lot of friends because I moved around so much. And by the time I'd really make a good friend, you know, uh, we'd move away. And that was gotten hard on me, so I, f I didn't make friends very easily. Cupid, however, smiled at Vonda once more, and she met a man named Lee Belafato. Belafato loved Sean instantly and took him as a son. Sean and Lee's relationship could not be defined as ideal, though, especially since Sean was not very used to having a father figure in his life. Vonda and Lee worked hard to provide for their family and eventually decided to start driving long-haul trucks to maximize their income. And this, unfortunately, meant that Sean had to spend most of his time with babysitters or relatives. Sean, who was used to not having any friends of his own, soon began to resent the mother he once adored because she was majorly absent in his life. He began to read about Satanism during this time, when he discovered a book belonging to one of his teen babysitters. Ten-year-old Sean had stolen the book and became insanely fascinated with the abnormal rendition of good and evil. He quickly became obsessed with the symbols, the ancient drawings, and all the fantasy that came with it. By the time he was 13, he got involved in playing Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons led me into witchcraft, which led me into Satanism. Sean built himself a fantasy world where he felt he belonged and didn't need his mother or stepfather. He relished the power he had from that world. He said in a jailhouse interview that when he first started practicing Satanism, he tried to keep the demons away but ultimately stopped. By the time he was 16, he had read the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey hundreds of times. As I got into more of this philosophy of good and evil being interchanged, I began to think of demons as my friends and I began to see that I was mistreating them by doing this. So I began to invoke demons and ask them to enter my body. The book seduced the young lad who felt like he could escape to somewhere unreal, where he had non-human friends. Sean delved deeper and deeper into his newfound religion, and it wasn't long until, in his own words, he'd formed an alliance with Satan. He met other kids who were interested in these practices and soon began to do everything they thought would make them good Satanists. They formed and led a coven named the Elimination, and their purpose was simple, get rid of Christianity. He would later say in an interview that they had to prove their allegiance to Satan. And to do that, we had to break the Ten Commandments, one by one, all of them. They began to lie, steal, and do every other one that they considered easy. In the end, there was only one that remained unbroken. You shall not murder. Sean would say in his interview that only one was not easy, and murder, he did. In 1985, Sean and his friend, fueled by the words of the Satanic Bible which told them, You should choose people who by their actions basically beg to be killed, who contribute nothing to society, who can... Uh, who won't be missed, who have no one. Pick their first victim. Robert Paul Bauer was a 32-year-old Circle K convenience store and worked night shifts. Sean and his buddy Richard walked into the convenience store with Sean armed with the weapon. Richard asked Bauer how much something cost to momentarily distract him, and as he looked up from his cup of coffee, Sellers fired a shot at him. He missed. Bauer immediately started yelling at him to stop and made for the cash register to give them all the money thinking they were there to rob him. The helpless man soon realized that the kids whom he knew and who frequented the store 
door, were not there to rob him. He took off running in the direction he thought Richard, the unarmed one, was in. He didn't know that the teenagers had switched positions and that he was running straight to the aggressor. Sellers raised the gun again and fired. This time he hit Bauer, who was only about two feet away from him. Both boys immediately fled the scene. I remember we laughed about it. We, uh... We thought it was so funny. Their first kill gave them wings to soar. Sellers, who had become powerful in his head and basking in the euphoria of having taken a life, soon started to have big problems with his parents. He did not want to be parented anymore. He wanted to live as he wanted since he was now feared among his peers for killing a man and getting away with it, apparently. He tried to move out, but his parents refused and took him back home. He started doing what he termed destruction rituals on his parents, but they just weren't giving up on disciplining him. Sellers began to have recurring dreams about killing his parents. And and the best way I can describe it is one day I woke up and it was no longer a dream. On March 5th, 1986, while everyone else slept, Sean woke up, took his father's point .44 revolver handgun, and walked down the hall into the room where his mother and stepfather slept, wearing the black underwear he used for his rituals. He first shot and killed his stepfather, Lee, as he slept. He didn't even have a chance. He turned the gun towards his mother and fired blindly as he couldn't see in the darkness. He missed the shot. His mother was awoken by the shots, and before she could process the events unfolding before before her, Sean shot her in the face. He left his parents' bedroom, laid the gun down, and went to take a shower. A shower he said he remembered clearly because it woke him up. He went back to the scene and turned on the lights. He stared at his mom's lifeless remains and would say, And I remember laughing and giggling hysterically like I did whenever we killed the guy so okay. Sellers tried to disguise his guilt by arranging the crime scene to look as though an intruder had committed the killings and went off to Richard's house. He was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder. It was during his time in jail that he converted to Christianity and had his attorneys argue that he committed the murders while he was demon-possessed. They presented facts about Sellers probably having multiple personality disorder and that he may have been insane at the time of his crimes. The jury refused to consider any of his and his attorneys' claims. Sellers was found guilty of multiple homicides homicides and sentenced to death in 1986. At the time, Oklahoma law did not allow jurors to condemn someone to life in prison without the possibility of release as this option only became available in 1987. A juror later stated that the panel believed Sellers would be paroled in 7 to 15 years and that that jail term seemed insufficient. As a result, the jury chose the death punishment. Other jurors denied this was even discussed during the deliberations. All his appeals were disregarded, and even though human rights organizations put their weight behind him, his conviction was not overturned. Sellers appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, but the court declined his appeal. On the 3rd of February, 1999, Sellers ate his last meal of egg rolls, sweet and sour shrimp, and batter-fried shrimp in his cell at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. He was then led to the execution chamber, where he read his final statement to his step-siblings. By 12.17 a.m. the next day, Sean Sellers was pronounced dead, five minutes after the lethal drugs were injected, aged 29. He is one of 22 persons in United States history since the reinstatement of the death penalty in 1976 to be executed for a crime committed while under the age of 18 and the only individual to have been executed for a crime committed under the age of 17 George Stinney Jr. George Jr. Stinney Jr. was born October 21, 1929. He was an African-American boy who at the age of 14 was convicted and executed for the murders of Betty June Binnickard and Mary Emma Thames in March 1944 in his hometown of Alkaloo, South Carolina. He was convicted sentenced to death, and executed by electric chair three months later, becoming the youngest American with an exact birth date, confirmed to be sentenced to death and executed in the 20th century. Seventy years later, a South Carolina court would rule that young Stinney had received an unfair trial and declare that he was wrongfully executed. What did Stinney Jr. do? Stinney Jr. lived in Alkaloo, South Carolina with his father, George Stinney Sr., mother, Amy. He had one brother, Charles, and two sisters, Catherine and Amy. Stinney's father worked at the town sawmill, and the family lived in company housing. Alkaloo was a tiny, working-class mill town divided by railway tracks between white and black neighborhoods. The town looked like any other tiny southern town at the time. There was little interaction between white and black citizens due to segregated schools and churches. On the 24th of March, 1944, Stinney Jr. was playing outside in the yard of his parents' home with his younger sister Amy when two young girls riding on bikes approached and asked them where they could find Maypops, a local name for passion flowers, and went on their way. Way. As evening approached the two girls, Betty aged 11 and Mary aged 7 failed to return home and a search party was immediately organized to find the girls. Stinney Sr. and Jr. joined in the search and Stinner
Skinner Jr. casually told a bystander that he had seen the girls earlier. The next day, the bodies of Betty June and Mary Emma were found in a shallow ditch on the African-American side of Alkaloo. The little girls had been beaten with a weapon which was determined to be a piece of blunt metal or a railroad spike. Both girls suffered extremely severe wounds from the blunt force trauma that their skulls were penetrated. The medical examiner determined that Mary Emma was not sexually assaulted, but that Betty June had suffered some bruising in her female parts. Stinney was arrested on suspicion of murdering the girls. He was subjected to hours of interrogation in the absence of his parents or an attorney. Hours later, the arresting officer, H.S. Newman, a Clarendon County deputy, stated, I arrested a boy by the name of George Stinney. He then made a confession and told me where to find a piece of iron, about 15 inches where he said he put it in a ditch about six feet from the bicycle. Stinney Sr. immediately fired from his job at the local sawmill, and he had to evacuate the company residence he occupied with his family. They received an unspeakable amount of threats and were denied access to their son who was confined in jail. On March 26th, a mob attempted to lynch George, but he had already been moved to an out-of-town jail. Every proceeding against young Stinney, including jury selection, took place on April 24, 1944. He was appointed a defense attorney in the person of Charles Plowden, a tax commissioner campaigning for election to local office. Plowden did nothing to defend the underaged boy. The prosecuting counsel presented two different versions of Stinney's alleged confession. In one version, Stinney was attacked by the girls after he tried to help one girl who had fallen in the ditch, and he killed them in self-defense. In the other version, he had followed the girls, first attacking Mary Emma and then Betty June. There was no written record of Stinney's confession apart from Deputy Newman's statement, but Powden did not dispute. Three police officers testified at the trial. The prosecutors called three witnesses to the stand, including the man who found the bodies of the girls, Reverend Francis Batson, and the two doctors who performed the autopsy of the girls. The counsel put forward the case of sexual assault as a possibility too. Powden called no witnesses, did not cross-examine the prosecuting counsel's witnesses, and did little to defend young Stinney. The courtroom was filled to the brim with over a thousand Americans allowed. No African Americans were allowed in the courtroom, and so George Stinney Jr. sat alone, the only black person in the courtroom awaiting his fate. The entirety of his trial lasted two hours. The all-white jury deliberated for a meager ten minutes and found Stinney guilty of murder. Judge Philip H. Stoll sentenced Stinney to death by electrocution. There is no written record of the trial and no appeal was filed by Stinney's counsel. Stinney's shattered family, who had no contact with him during his 81 days in confinement and trial, filed appeals. They were then allowed to see him once after the trial, when he was held in the Columbia Penitentiary. Under the threat of lynching, they were not allowed to see him again. Churches and the NAACP joined in appealing to Governor Olin D. Johnston for clemency, given the age of the boy, while others encouraged the governor to let the execution continue. The governor agreed to the latter. Governor Johnson visited Stinney Jr. in the death house two days before he was to sit in the electric chair. Johnston later wrote a response to one appeal for clemency, stating, I have just talked with the officer who made the arrest in this case. It may be interesting for you to know that Stinney killed the smaller girl to the larger one. Then he killed the larger girl and her dead body. Twenty minutes later, he returned and attempted to her again, but her body was too cold. All of this he admitted himself. On the 16th of June, 1994, at 7.30 a.m., Stinney, who weighed only 90 pounds, was led into the execution chamber and prepared for death. The executioner used a Bible as a booster seat because Stinney was too small for the chair. He was strapped to the chair and asked if he had any last words to say, to which he shook his head. The executioner pulled a strap from the chair to cover his mouth, causing Stinney to burst into tears. A loose-fitting mask was placed over his small face as he continued to sob. The switch was flipped on, and Stinney was electrocuted to death. The mask slipped off to reveal tears streaming down his face. In 2004, George Frierson, a local historian who grew up in Alkaloo, started researching the case after reading a newspaper article about it. He set out to exonerate Stinney. His work gained the attention of South Carolina lawyers Steve McKenzie and Matt Burgess. Other individuals soon joined and contributed countless hours of research and review of historical documents and found witnesses and evidence to assist in exonerating Stinney. The team, which now included the Civil Rights Body, Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project, CRRJ, filed a motion for a new trial on October 25, 2013. McKenzie and Burgess, along with attorney Ray Chandler, representing Stinney's family with Steve McKenzie saying, if we can get the case reopened, we can go to the judge and say, there wasn't any reason to convict this child. There was no evidence to present to the jury.
jury. There was no transcript. This case needs to be reopened. This is an injustice that needs to be righted. I'm pretty optimistic that if we can get the witnesses we need to come forward, we will be successful in court. We hopefully have a witness that's going to say, that's non-family, non-relative witness, who is going to be able to tie all this in and say that they were basically an alibi witness. They were there with Mr. Stinney, and this did not occur. Frierson stated in interviews, there has been a person that has been named as being the culprit who is now deceased, an alternate suspect by modern-day researchers. Instead of ordering a new trial, Circuit Court Judge Carmen Mullen overturned Stinney's conviction on December 16, 2014. He did not get a fair trial, she found, since he was not successfully defended, and his Sixth Amendment rights were infringed. She said, I can think of no greater injustice, even though the state argued despite all unfairness to the case, Stinney's conviction should stand. George Stinney Jr. was cleared of a crime he did not commit, and in January 2022, South Carolina State Representative Caesar McKnight introduced a bill named after Stinney, titled the George Stinney Fund, which would make the state of South Carolina pay $10 million to the families of the wrongfully executed if their conviction is posthumously overturned. Napoleon Beasley Napoleon Beasley was sentenced to death by lethal injection for the murder of 63-year-old businessman John Luddig on April 19, 1994. He was 17 when he shot and killed Luddig to steal his Mercedes-Benz. Beasley's story shines light on what many described as a double life, which would end in his execution a few years later. Beasley was born on the 5th of August, 1976. He was described as an honor roll student, class president, star athlete with dreams of going to Stanford Law. He was the starting running back for the Grapeland School Sandys for a season and a 440 relay track runner. Beasley was even set to join the Marine Corps after high school. All was great for Beasley and his family was proud of him. His father, Ireland Beasley, was a steel worker and a city councilman in Grapeland, and his mother, Rena, was the secretary to the county judge. On the 5th of June, 1994, 47 days after the murder of renowned businessman and Korean War veteran John Luddig, and two weeks after his graduation from high school, Napoleon Beasley was arrested. It was a shock to the community that Beasley, who graduated 13th from his class of 60, had been arrested on suspicion of murder. What many people did not know was that Napoleon Beasley lived two lives, one as a golden boy and another as a crack dealer. On the day of the murder, the 17-year-old high school senior came home from track practice, showered and changed into a fresh pair of blue jeans. He loaded his Haskell .45 caliber semi-automatic pistol, tucked it into his pants, and set out to meet up with friends and brothers, Donald and Cedric Coleman, 18 and 19 years old respectively. He brought along a sawed-off shotgun too. He told a friend earlier that day that he might soon be driving a Mercedes to school, and that evening, he set off to acquire his new ride. Beasley took his mother's red Ford probe and drove to Corsicana. They began to drive to Tyler, Texas, and on the way, Beasley spotted a Lexus. He told Cedric to floor it, but they lost sight of it as they got into Tyler. After unsuccessfully attempting to carjack the Lexus, the trio headed to a local restaurant where they spotted a Mercedes in the restaurant's parking lot. As the driver of the Mercedes exited his vehicle, Beasley jumped out of his car armed with the .45 caliber pistol. However, the driver entered the restaurant before Beasley could reach him, apparently without noticing. Cedric yelled at Beasley to get back into the car, and without stopping to eat, Cedric began driving the group back home. Beasley ordered Cedric to turn around and return to Tyler, commenting, You know, I guess I'm going to have to shoot my driver. Cedric then pulled the car over and told Beasley that, under the circumstances, he would have to do his own driving. Beasley took the wheel and stayed it again that he wanted to steal a car. When Cedric asked why, Beasley explained that he wanted to see what it was like to kill somebody. As they drove back into Tyler, they spotted a cream-colored 1987 Mercedes owned by John Luddig. He and his wife, Bobby Luddig, were on their way home from Dallas. Beasley followed the couple to their home and stopped at the end of the driveway. He got out of the car after he had stripped off his shirt. Armed with his loaded pistol, Beasley ran toward the garage with Donald following, carrying Beasley's sawed-off shotgun. Beasley fired one round from his pistol, hitting Mr. Luddig in the side of the head, leaving him alive but stunned and in a seated position. He next ran around the car where Mrs. Luddig was getting out of the vehicle and fired at her at close range. Although he missed, she fell to the ground and played dead. Beasley ordered Donald to shoot the but Donald did not comply as he turned back to John Luddig and fired point-blank into Mr. Luddig's head. He then walked through his victim's blood and ravaged his pockets looking for the keys to the Mercedes. As he searched for the keys, Beasley asked Donald if Mrs. Luddig was dead. When Donald said she was still moving, Beasley shouted for him to shoot her, but Donald refused again. Beasley then moved to shoot her, but Donald quickly shouted that she was dead. He got into the car and drove off the driveway with the Coleman brothers following suit in his mother's car. He ran the car into a retaining wall, 
causing him to abandon it only a short distance away. He reunited with his friends and told them that he would get rid of anyone who said anything about the incident. The trio then returned to Grapeland. Beasley told a friend a few days after the incident that he and the Coleman brothers had attempted to steal a car and that he had shot a guy three times in the head and attempted to kill a lady. On the day he was arrested, too stunned to understand what the authorities were saying, his father asked if he truly committed the crime of which he was accused, and he replied that he indeed had. Beasley was charged with the murder of John Luddig, who was the father of United States Federal Judge J. Michael Luddig. Judge Luddig, in addressing the judge before sentencing, said, On behalf of my dad, and on behalf of my mother and family, I respectfully request that those who committed this brutal crime receive the full punishment that the law provides. On March 17, 1995, Napoleon Beasley was sentenced to death by lethal injection by the state of Texas. Beasley made a series of appeals including to the U.S. Supreme Court. During the course of his appeals, three out of nine justices recused themselves because of their personal ties to Judge Luddig, leaving six justices to review the case. His appeals were denied. On June 28, 2001, Beasley applied for a state of execution from the Supreme Court. On August 13th, the Supreme Court voted 3-3 on Beasley's request for a stay of execution. The tie ultimately denied his request for a stay. Two days later, the Court of Criminal Appeals granted a stay of execution on the day of Beasley's scheduled execution. Beasley relentlessly appealed his conviction from 1997 until 2002, had reflected on the life he had before he murdered John Luddig. During an interview on Texas's death row, he said, I went to school. I went to Sunday school every Sunday. I walked old ladies across the street, all that stuff. Beasley's own reasons for clemency did not line up with those of his attorney or the advocates who were pleading for him. He didn't argue that his conviction or punishment was unreasonable or that he didn't deserve to die because he was only 17 when the crime was done. He remarked from death row, I don't like to provide explanations or excuses. It shouldn't have happened whether I was 15, 16, 17, 21, or 25. He said that he was remorseful for what he had done, was a changed person, and was no longer a threat to anyone. It's my fault, he said in a court hearing in April. I violated the law, I violated this city, and I violated a family. I'm sorry. I wish I had a second chance to make up for it. He claimed he couldn't figure out what led to him being on death row and filing numerous appeals. He claimed he felt sorry for Judge Luddig, whose father he killed, and that he couldn't bring himself to say something to them. What can you say to somebody in that situation? No words could comfort him, not coming from me anyway. I don't think I would say anything. I think I would for once just listen. What would I do if somebody murdered my daddy? How would I feel? He said. As the time for his conviction drew close, several bodies weighed in, arguing in favor of clemency due to the age at the time of the murder. Judge Luddig didn't share the same sentiment as others as he overlooked the age and supported the capital punishment. He said, individuals must be held accountable at some point for actions such as this. I thought this was an appropriate case for the death penalty. The Coleman brothers were sentenced to 40 years in prison for their involvement in the crime. On May 28, 2002, the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles rejected the last of the dozens of appeals by Beasley. They voted 10, 7 against commuting Beasley's sentence to life in prison. Governor Rick Perry declared declined to grant an emergency 30-day stay, and so, he was scheduled to be killed by 6 p.m. on that day. He refused his final meal and declined to read his final statement asking that it be read after his execution. He remained calm as he was strapped onto the gurney save for his twitching right foot. Napoleon Beasley, who had bade his family farewell days before, was executed by lethal injection at 6 p.m. on the 28th of May, 2002, aged 25. Beasley was one of the last juvenile offenders to be executed in the United States. States, and in 2005, the Supreme Court banned the practice of executing offenders who were under 18 when they committed their crimes. It's mind-boggling that at a time not so far off, children could stand before adults and be tried as one themselves. Absurd, isn't it? Watch more absurdity right here.